this is the story of a garden for sharing, not just with the birds and the bees, with friends and family, but with many others too, as you will discover as the story unfolds. I'm Anne Massey and our garden story begins when my husband John and myself moved here in 1999. The garden, though not large, is four times bigger than our previous garden. Little did I know at that time just how important this garden was to become to us, as it literally transformed our lives. As one of six children growing up in a home which had substantial grounds, I had absolutely no interest in the garden. Over time, my parents sold off two plots of land from parts of the garden where I had never even ventured. The gardening bug, however, must be in my genes. And in their last home together, on the Scottish Isle of Arran, a photograph of my parents' garden was used as the back cover of a beautifully illustrated book, The Most Beautiful Villages of Scotland. The borrowed landscape which they enjoyed includes the ruins of Lochranza Castle, looking across to the Mull of Cantire on the mainland. The first year after our house move, we set about getting the layout right. This was to include a two-level pond, which could be viewed directly from the conservatory. The soil excavated from the pond was used to raise the levels towards the back right-hand side of the garden. We were lucky enough to have a mature Acer campestry. This allowed us to introduce two sets of steps, splitting the garden into upper and lower levels. Towards the opposite corner of the garden, we built a curved pergola with some inset trellis which created an area just waiting to be discovered, one of my own personal favourite parts of the garden. A cleverly angled mirror also gives the illusion of the garden continuing along a gravel path and through an archway. As this area matured over the years, it has caught out many a garden visitor. It was only two years later that we decided to enter the best back garden category of the local garden competition, and to our astonishment we won. The judges were very complimentary and also commented that they would look forward to coming back to see our front garden finished. We were hard at work at the time digging out 22 tonnes of soil to create the central sunken circle. And lo and behold the following year we were delighted to win the best front garden category too. It was around this time that John faced redundancy, fortunately with 12 months notice, so time to plan for his next career move. Having worked 33 years in office, he fancied a change. He knew he could build pergolas, ponds and do paving, so decided to turn his hand to landscaping. And much to his horror, I decided to hand in my notice at work and join him, so that I could take care of the other essential P in landscaping, the planting. A few close friends put their trust in us to design and landscape their own gardens, and our business took off. I also heard of a competition to be run on Channel 4, called the Great Garden Challenge. We had not long started our business of course, and it would mean taking time off work, but we decided to go for it, as it might benefit us in the future, if we were successful in the competition. 
We were delighted when our initial design was selected from apparently thousands of applicants. John and I were to be one of 24 teams in a knockout competition to build a show garden 5 metres square in just three days in the grounds of the beautiful Blenheim Palace in Oxfordshire. Welcome back to the Great Garden Challenge live from Blending Palace and it's not just the weather that's hotting up, competition is fierce between our two teams. Of course only one can go through to the finals so we need your help and more importantly they need your help. You do need to get to your phone and vote. And of course Chris is going to give his verdict on Anne and John's garden very shortly. This is Macintosh Ladies, the garden that took Anne and John through to the semi-finals. And this is how they made their semi-final garden, a pond-side pallet over the last four days. Have they bitten off more than they can chew with their latest garden? This garden, we reckon, will be our biggest challenge. We've taken on quite a lot to achieve this in three days. Um, we, we know what we're doing, it's just whether we can fit it all into the, the time we have. And then I think we'll walk it in this way. Okay. Summer house, what a laugh. Look at this. Day two, it's raining cats and dogs and they've got a summer house to build. By the afternoon, John's putting the decking down while Anne gives Anne-Marie a guided tour. Here. Acer will be about your height here, so the idea is you can't actually see the pond until you're through past the Acer. It is absolutely <laughs> lovely, this garden. I just Very love peaceful. sitting underneath this canopy. It's so cooling to be beside this pond and under this canopy on such a warm day as a day, isn't it? It is, yeah. Beautiful. Now, I think they've made most use of the space, actually, because this needs to be backed off and it's right at the edge of the plot, so they've got lots of opportunity then to make as big a pond as possible. And get some of their gorgeous planting in. It's just absolutely beautiful. I think Anna's really excelled herself here. What's your favourite? Well, I've got lots of favourites. Sounded hopeful, didn't it? However, despite the judges' favourable comments and us winning the public vote by an overwhelming majority that day, we were beaten at the semi-final stage. That's television, darling. The Wokingham Times had followed us through the competition. From our round one woodland garden, to our quarter-final Charles Rennie Macintosh inspired garden. And of course, our semi-final garden, a pond-side pallet. We were naturally disappointed to lose with what we considered to be our best garden. We were, however, exhausted and perhaps slightly relieved not to have to build a fourth garden just a week later. With our own garden now a little more mature, we decided to open it and share it with others, raising money for charities. Over the years we have opened for Red Cross, the National Garden Scheme, and more recently the Thames Valley Air Ambulance, helping raise many thousands of pounds for worthy causes paid for by the thousands of visitors who have visited our garden. As a result of the advertising for the open days, we were approached by a Japanese garden writer and also Nicola Stoken Tompkins, a very highly regarded English garden writer and photographer. And so our garden has been enjoyed by many readers too, as it has featured in an English garden in a Japanese magazine, followed by Nicola's excellent articles in 25 Beautiful Gardens, Property Ladder magazine, and Women's Weekly Gardening Special. A major recent change to the garden was the rebuilding of the upper pond. By extending it, we were able to bridge over it, and this has become a favourite spot for photographs for those visiting the garden, including this group of Japanese garden design students. They took plenty of photographs of the garden, of course, as expected. They even took photographs of the tea and biscuits. As summer turns to autumn and the flowers develop their seed heads, time to look back at the season just gone to remind us of how the garden looked in the depths of winter. Then the first flush of spring with the freshness of new growth. And the colourful perennials providing interest from May right through until October. It's also time to look back at how circumstances brought me to where I am today. Had my parents not been keen gardeners, perhaps I would not have been either. Had it not been for my own redundancy payout in 1999, we would not have moved to this house with its larger garden. Had I not entered the gardening competitions, we would not have had the confidence to open our garden. Had John not been made redundant, 
we would never have started our business. Although my job description of taking care of the planting side of things seems to have developed somewhat over the years. And finally, had I not recently stumbled upon this leaflet for Film Club, this documentary would never even have been made.